Okay, hello. I'm going to start a series here to go over some basic UEFI or EFI programming in C, since that was used for the reference implementation of it, and I figure we'll follow along in the same language they wrote the thing in, right? <laughs> but what is UEFI? Why would you care? Why should you care? It stands for the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Unified, the U, being taken from the UEFI or Unified EFI Forum, which is just a group, a consortium of companies that handle the specifications for UEFI and some other things like ACPI and other acronyms you might not know about. So Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, originally just the Extensible Firmware Interface. So that means we have an extendable, extendable interface to firmware. So firmware being, you know, the layer between software and hardware on your machine, you can flash it usually, but it's code that lives in microcontrollers and things on your motherboard or in your laptop, whatever, what have you. We need a way of talking to that that can be modular or extendable. And the reason for this coming about was Intel did not, it, they weren't too keen on keeping the legacy BIOS around forever. And recently, at least as of 2020, I think Intel's taking out uh, previous legacy BIOS booting. You know, 16-bit, just writing 512 bytes to a, a drive and being able to boot up from that with the 55AA at the end of it, right? They're getting rid of that as a, as a format, as a standard. We're going to this more specified standard, we'll say, of EFI. Intel gave it over to the UEFI forum around 2005, and, you know, the rest is history. But newer stuff is not available to boot from legacy BIOS, at least without CSM booting. And Intel has been getting rid of that, and newer machines... Like my laptop, I got a Dell XPS from a, a couple years ago. It does not support legacy BIOS booting, so it only supports EFI or UEFI boot. So maybe you want to know how to program a bootloader for that, or just how to work with it, or maybe you just you know want to know a little bit more about what happens in a pre-OS environment. There is a thing before UEFI even loads too. There's a couple other stages, like uh, I think the security stage is first, and then the driver execution environment, and then that goes into what EFI is, what I'll be programming for. But my purpose for this is to make a 64-bit, a long mode bootloader for it for x86. So, and I need to program for EFI for newer machines that might not support legacy BIOS booting. So that's, that's my purpose for this. But you can read more about it if you want. Uh, if you want to know how to program for it, all the specs are available online for free, which is really nice. So there's some things that are kind of legal legalese, but uh, I'm not making a profit on this, so I think I'll be okay. But if you go to uefi.org, the developers thing here, specifications library, you have access to the specs, PDF or HTML, which the PDF seems to be generated from the HTML, and there's visual errors more so in the PDF, but I'll be using that for an offline source. Um, for ACPI, advanced configuration power interface, and for the EFI spec. So ACPI you'll need if you want to sort of enumerate what devices and hardware are connected to your machine and if you want to go through like sleep states and power on and off and things. Uh, UEFI I'll be programming for in a pre-OS environment. And there's also the shell. So UEFI comes with a, a standard shell in emulation or on hardware. And the pre-UEFI place, the platform initialization spec, they also have that. But I'll just be grabbing the UEFI one here, you know, the PDF. We have that. I have this on my machine, but that's where you get the specs for it, which can take a while to load first time, but you can download that. Okay, so I got my, my handy dandy things here. Find the specs there. What is it? It's replacement for PC BIOS, and we have the specs for free. So how do you develop for this? I'm going to be using C, a modern, so C11 and up standard is what I'll be using just for uh, some Unicode support that's better handled. But we'll need a C compiler. If you want to use GCC or Clang, those are what I'll be supporting on Linux and Windows. I'll try to make it work for both, probably through MinGW. Uh, Clang comes from LOVM. It's a front end to it, and it has all targets usually installed by default, so it's fairly easy. GCC natively, I think, only supports uh, ELF executable and linkable files. So we're going to want a cross compiler for that to make portable, executable, or PE files for a Windows environment or a Microsoft environment. UEFI was made with um, pr probably a lot of input from Microsoft, it seems. Their spec kind of follows their programming conventions for C and things. And they define needing a PE executable, so we'll need a cross-compiler if you want to use GCC. Um, to build it, I'm going to use Make. You could use Build Scripts. So this is optional, but I'll make a really, you know, some pretty minimal small Make files just to build. 
if you want to emulate it and test it not on hardware for a faster you know development speed i'm going to use keymu or quick emulator qemu you could probably use virtualbox or other things if you want i'm just used to qemu so i'll use that uh, it it does not come by default with some firmware for efi so to emulate that i'm going to use ovmf from the tiano core uh, spec the tiano core implementation of uefi they have their own open firmware for virtual machines or OVMF. That's what that stands for. Open virtual machine firmware for EFI. Um, you'll need something to make an image to put your EFI applications into. So the EFI spec defines a GPT or GUID partition table uh, format. So we can make images or files that represent a disk with that GPT format and we can write that to a USB or something and boot from it to be able to test on emulation and on hardware. Uh, and, you know, if you want to use it on hardware, I'm going to assume a USB drive. So you'll need that and you'll need something to write to it. So I'll go through setting that up on Linux and Windows. And then we'll go through an example EFI application, just setting some colors and rebooting um, or shutting down the machine just to test it on emulation and hardware. And we'll have a tool to make that GPT disk image. If you want ISOs, I may look into that later on, but I'm just going to start with the hard disk image because most people I know don't have CD-ROMs anymore. So, oh, well. But okay, we'll get to uh, installing the tools next for Linux and Windows. All right, so installing some tools here, starting off with a C compiler on Linux. I'm using Alpine Linux. And if you want to know the specific version, not that it really matters, I think we can look at APK repository. So I'm on 3.17. I'm not sure why I have a couple of duplicate links here, but anyway, I always have to break something eventually on, on my setups. But for Linux, I'm assuming Alpine, but um, Pac-Man or Apt or your package manager and whatever distro you're on should work. Similarly enough, you should be able to find GC GCC for something that you're on. You should be able to find Clang for something that you're on, and you can install those as you want. For me, that would be Alpine add Clang, for example, assuming I have permissions through do as or sudo, and it'll fetch and it'll install those things. Um, and we can get GCC, right? That should be here. If you don't have make, you can get make as well. So I'm just making sure that I have all these installed. For GCC specifically, it doesn't come with all the LOVM targets and backend that Clang does. So we will need a cross compiler. This is just for the regular version of GCC if you want to develop some supporting programs for EFI, like um, a program to make a GPT disk image, like I'll be doing in upcoming videos. So how do you get a cross compiler for GCC? I'm going to use the MinGW projects one which is x86 underscore 64 dash w64 dash mingw32 gcc. So if I search for that, it won't be the exact package, but it'll be, for my system, it's under mingw w64 gcc. So I would add that, for example. That may be how it is on yours. I'm not sure, but that's what I would add. And that would give access to this binary that we can then use as a gcc version. So. That's what I'll be using to make PE files on Linux for EFI applications, like an OS loader, what UEFI calls a bootloader, effectively. That's what I'll be using. Otherwise, I'll use Clang. And I'll try to test under both for Linux and Windows. So to install a C compiler under Windows, we'll go over here in the, in the browser here. And under Windows, there's a couple sort of, um, let's say, SDKs, some distros, some packages <laughs> that have GCC installed. You could use MSYS2, you could use SIGWIN, you could use WSL, WSL2. I like more things that I just have a portable file that I can put in one area, or folder, we'll say, that I can put <laughs> in some area and have it be, if I don't want it, I can just delete it to uninstall it, and it's not putting things everywhere in my system, like Windows stuff is apt to do. But uh, newin.net, this guy's stuff, I think he works for Microsoft. I had a, a good friend tell me about this a while back. Uh, it comes with, he has his own distro that comes with GCC, MinGW, 7-Zip, uh, Make, and that's all what I'm going to be using, <laughs> some versions of SDL and other things. But you can get an EXE, you can get it without Git. You just, uh, you can install that and run it, and it will just make its own folder. So I have that on mine under programming, it'll make a mingw folder, which has this stuff in it. And you can just make a shortcut to open distro window.bat, and that'll give you a GCC version for Windows, so it'll make portable executable files and make. And that's all I'm gonna be using for this series anyway. Uh, all right, there's another one if you don't like the DOS prompt sort of shell, if you want something like a Unix shell, 
with LS and all this stuff. Another one I like is W64 Dev Kit by this guy who also, I don't know if he works for Microsoft, but he's got a good blog, nullprogram.com. But it comes with MinGW, GDB, Make, some BusyBox utilities like a Shell, Vim, NASM. So I like this thing as a you know one-stop shop for a lot of stuff. But you can go to the releases page and you can grab the regular, whatever the newest one is, not the signature, but the regular zip file, or one with Tiny or 32-bit, Fortran, what have you. I'll just get the regular one. That's a zip file, it comes with a folder. And that folder looks like W64 Dev Kit, and it comes with this stuff, similar to the other one. And you can make a shortcut to W64 Dev Kit EXE. If you want things a little bit different, you can set up a home directory. I set mine in the any file it comes with, just to be to my programming folder, and then I set a, I set a little profile as well, just to set the PS1 prompt. So, because I'm used to it looking a little bit differently, but you can add those things to your path, right? W64 Dev Kit, and it has basically a, a more Unix-inspired shell. And the GCC and Make it comes with are good for Windows, so it'll make PE files, not ELF files, by default. That's usually how I do GCC and Make on Windows. Now, if you want to use Clang as well, you can, you know, go to the LOVM site, I believe, and download it or use Winget. I like to use Winget nowadays for package management on Windows to be similar to what I'm used to, but I'm sure their page has download links for stuff. Um, but if I use a terminal, I don't think we have Clang as an option in Winget, but I believe LOVM is, and it might show that. Yeah, we have LOVM, so you would use, I think, Winget install LOVM. And I already have it installed, but maybe it'll reinstall it. <laughs> it's a pretty large package there. I guess I'll get a new version. I didn't have it before. UAC prompts will make my screen black, so apologies. That's just me accepting a UAC prompt. Um, and I'm not going to show this for everything. This is just an example of using Winget for a large package here. Just in case, I'll close my other windows. That might have been the issue. <laughs> Uh, if you want to know at least where LOVM is, or if you want a package that's installed, I think it's Winget List or it's Show. One of these has info. Show will have that there. But assuming it's installed, you'd use Clang. If that doesn't install by default, it should place it into this part on your, your hard drive there by default. So C program files, LOVM should be where it's at. The bin folder holds Clang and other things. Uh, but that's for a C compiler on Windows, not for Make. So what else did I have to go through? Next we have QEMU. I'll try to go over and install that. Show that on, a, on Linux first. So QEMU, you should be able to find that with your package manager. Of course, it's typically on most things. You know, you'll have different systems involved. I would probably add, if you want to do 32-bit development system, i386, i386. If you want to do 64-bit, I'll be doing, we'll do x86-64. And you should have that installed. Sometimes the UI and other things are different. They're separate for them. So let's see, I'll search for a QEMU. Inside of my package file here. So the packages I have installed specifically are a base QEMU. I have documents for that. I have also audio. <laughs> so you might have different audio for Pulse or PyPy or something. You have the systems, and my UI, I'm using the GTK UI simply because it provides a window with zoom capabilities, makes it easier. But SDL is generally, I like SDL for um, cross-plat. But that's what I'm using. Those are my packages on my system. You might have just a QEMU package that includes everything by default. I don't know, but Alpine kind of separates them out. But that's on there. If you want it separately from the internet or you're on Windows, because I don't think... Um, Winget has QEMU. It might actually. You might want to install through QEMU. I need to do search, not just <laughs> the thing there. So we have QEMU here. So where do they where do they get that from? They get it from this site. So this looks like a weird link, but this does have the right download for that. So you could install it probably to your C drive or whatever through there. Otherwise, if you want to find it online qemu.org and we'd go to download page you go to your system 
download the source. If I'm on Windows, I'd go to Windows, get the 64-bit installer, and install it through there, or, you know, through Pac-Man or MSYS2. So that's where you'd get that. If you want to test that out on Windows or Linux, it would be similar. You'd just run the system with other flags, like an OVMF BIOS or whatever. But if we just run the base thing, it'll give us a window. By default, I have a GTK window, which doesn't have stuff installed, but I like GTK because I have Zoom. Generally, I have Zoom capabilities for this. Control-Alt, plus and minus, so I can show things. But that's there, and it would be the same on Linux. You know, just showing it's the same here. Exit with Control-Alt-Q. And that's making sure you have QEMU installed. So what if you want to emulate an EFI BIOS? We'll need OVMF. That may also be available in your package manager on Linux. And you would install that. By default, mine is in user share OVMF. And it gives a BIOS.bin file, which should have everything you need for, on my system, a 64-bit OVMF BIOS. Uh, if you're on Windows, I don't think that's in WinGit. You can get it online, though. Or if you want the latest version, you want the latest version of OVMF that may not be in your package manager, you can get it online from TianoCore, their GitHub page. Um, all the links to everything I'll have in the description, by the way, if, you, if I'm going too fast, I'm trying to keep this down pretty much on time. <laughs> but OVMF here, they provide their own builds, or Gerd Hoffman provides his own builds under some RPM files. So if you need to get those, I recommend 7-zip if you don't have an RPM package manager. I like 7-Zip. It should be available through your repos on Linux, or you can download it from the website here, like on Windows. It may also be in WinGit. I'm not sure. I like learning these things if I haven't looked them up before. Okay, so we have 7-Zip through WinGit as well, so we can install through there. That's nice. Or you can install it from the website. So I like that, but OVMF, we'll go to craxel.org slash repos. We'll go to Jenkins folder, the EDK2 folder, and this provides builds for different systems, uh, although it doesn't show the full name here on mine. <laughs> I'm on 64-bit x86, so I'll grab the x64 link. IA32 would be 32-bit x86 or Arch, right? That comes with a thing. I'll just put it in downloads. Comes with an RPM file. So here, so I'll go to 7-zip, and we can either extract it or open it if you want to see what's in there. It has a CPIO file and a user folder share. We'll go under QEMU firmware. We have different things for JSON files, but I'm not going to do that. We'll go under EDK2Git, OVMF-X64, and we'll have some FD files here. So FD, I guess, means file descriptor in this case, but these are just pure binary files, and if we want a BIOS that works, we'll just grab... Um, one of these, I'll grab the pure EFI-FD, probably open it outside or copy it outside. Uh, the CSM is compatibility support module for legacy BIOS booting, and we also have separate code and VARS versions if you want to specify that. But I'll just grab one with both code and VARS for only EFI, so I'll grab the pure EFI-FD. So let's say I open it outside. I don't know if I can extract it from here, like cut it. We'll see if copying works. I don't remember. <laughs> I should know these things. I can't cut and paste. Okay, well that shows what's in there. All right, that shows what's in there. So what I can do instead is just extract it here. Get the CPIO file. I'll extract that here. And I already have a user file from doing that before, so let me get rid of that. <laughs> we'll just extract that here again to get the user file. I'll get rid of that stuff. We'll go through. EDK2 git, OVMF64, let me grab the pure EFI, copy that. You can put that somewhere, so let's say we have a, a programming folder for UEFI programming. All right, I'll just put that in here. And you can keep it the same or rename it. Since it's BIOS.bin on Linux, when I just get it from a repo, I'm just going to name this BIOS or BIOS64 to specify a 64-bit BIOS. And you would use that with QEMU. Let me just open that. Open this folder in here. I don't want to do the storage daemon. System x8664. You'd use that with QEMU as the dash BIOS flag. You'd give it that, fo that file. Uh, by default, UEFI, the shell and everything, is going to try to do PXE, Pixie Boot, um, over the net. So I'm just going to set net none so it doesn't give me that option. 
And this is just going to verify that we have EDK2 and the UEFI shell installed from this OVMF BIOS. And I want to be able to drag the window. <laughs> so from this OVMF BIOS file that we got, the shell coming up here means that we have it installed all right. So you have the version, you'll have different things you can use here. We don't have a file system or anything, so that's not going to matter to us by default. So that's just showing that. I'll do exit just to show that it has a, you know, its own built-in BIOS as well. We'll just uh, exit this window. Okay. So that's assuming OVMF is installed. You do the same thing on Linux here to test. So system x8664, we'll give a BIOS. Mine is under user share OVMF. So if you don't symlink or move that or copy that file, that's the default location, at least for mine. We'll set .NET none, dash .NET none. We're not using .NET anyway, but yeah, that's all right. Grab that here, and this is just showing, you know, I have this installed and we have the shell and everything. Okay, so I know that's working. That goes over Kimu and OVMF. So you'll need something to make a disk image because you can't just write legacy BIOS style, 512 bytes. You'll need something to make an image. So how do you get that? Well, with the help of others and reading copious amounts of documentation and one or two other projects, I made a tool to do that. And this, coincidentally, I'll be rewriting this on the upcoming videos. If you're interested in how you would make a disk image, how, how do you write a program to make a disk image, I'll be rewriting this tool um, in the next upcoming, you know, few videos here. Or I'll at least show how you would write that. So I made this last year, again, with the help of other people. And it is the UEFI GPT image creator. It just writes by default, if I can show this picture. <laughs> it just writes by default a disk image, 256 meg with an EFI system partition and a basic data partition. And it's valid and it boots up in Kimu and on hardware. So I made a little single file C program for that. And I'll be again rewriting this in the upcoming videos to have it on video so you can do your own as well if you're interested. But I would just, you know, git clone that if you want a tool to write stuff. So that's what I have in this folder here. It comes with this thing. And I have shell scripts right now. So if you want to build it, you should be able to build it. If you want to run it, you should be able to run it. And it'll make a file, you know, test.image by default that you can boot within QEMU. And assuming you have a boot x64 file, we can run that and test, you know, our, our developments for EFI. That's it. You can get that on Windows or Linux. It'll build on both. I provide build scripts for both, but I'll be writing just a minimal make file probably in the next video to build it as well. So that's a program to make that. Assuming you want to write this to a USB, I'll get a tiny, I got a tiny USB now that has a USB-C and USB-A. And it was a lot, it looked bigger on the online pictures. That never happens, right? But it works. A little SanDisk 64 gig. So I'll put that into test. If we want to write stuff to a USB, we can do that. And you'll need a USB for that. So on Linux, if you want to write to a USB, DD works. That should be installed on most or all systems by default. You probably use LSB OK. If you don't have that, then you can. That should be available through your package manager. But that'll give you these things here. Um, in my virtual machine, I'm going to have to add. Sand this. Let me do this. Connect it. I have to add that to my guest because I'm in a VM and that did not show up. Usually it would show up here under block devices. Okay, I might have to mess with that a bit, but you know what? I do have another USB as a backup I can show. <laughs> we always got to break things on the old queso here. All right, my SanDisk Cruiser I can connect. I'll just mark that there just to confirm it is connected. All right, that one I do have. That shows up as SDV. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> I'll have to, this is a new USB, so I'll probably have to write stuff to it for it to show correctly under some situations. But anyway, it doesn't have any formatted stuff on it. 
SDB as a device. If you want to use DD on Linux, we would just set, you know, our input device to whatever file we, we have. Say we have a disk image, it would be, you know, disk image dot image or something. OF will write directly to the drive. And we'll say block size, you probably want to be larger than the default 512 byte. So it'll write faster, say like one meg or, or more. And then that'll write to USB and you should be all right to take it out when it's done and, and boot from it. On Windows, there are versions of DD out there, but I like Rufus. It's just a little gooey thing. I'm not using Etcher or whatever. I'm using just a little a little gooey thing here. Rufus, I like to get the portable version. 322 is newer than what I have, so maybe I'll I'll get that myself actually. Put it in. I'll just put it in this folder. That's fine. That's fine. Put it in my programming folder here. We'll run the portable version. UAC prompt will black out my screen. It can check for sure, check for applications. It looks like this. This newer version here. So my disk is in my VM, so let me disconnect that from there. Connect it to the host. Rufus should, yeah, it'll show up now. So it says no label, we'll have a disk or ISO file. Let's say I have, go through here, I should have a file in here, the test.image for example. Let's try to get that written to the disk. So I would select that. And we'd go find it. Windows in its uh, GUI and mouse oriented thing. It recognizes .img by default. So I do that and we do just start and that should be fine. It says partition schemes MBR, it, it'll be fine. Um, we're not targeting BIOS, we're targeting GPT, but just writing it directly to the disk should be okay. All data will be destroyed. This is about how fast it would take through DD anyway. This is just a more GUI, you know, with status bar way of doing things. Okay, and when it's done, it'll be green and ready. Don't press start again, it'll write it again. You can do close and you'll be all right. So, okay, then you can yank that bad boy out of there and, uh, and boot from it. That's all the should be the tools we need to write everything. So next I'll go over an example EFI application, just the hello world thing pretty much, and we'll test that on Q QEMU and on hardware. All right, so let's go over an example EFI application for a bootx 64efi file. This is an EFI, uh, not really OS loader, but technically just an EFI application built from a C file, it's a C program, it's a PE executable file. The reason it has this name is that the UEFI spec defines some certain names for files that you can put within certain areas in the EFI system partition, which is a FAT32 file system. Well, I'll be doing a FAT32, it supports FAT12 or 16 as well, but I'll be doing FAT32. But if you have a FAT file system set up within under root in an EFI system partition, you'll have root, you'll have an EFI subfolder, a boot subfolder, and if you put your EFI application in there and name it boot x64.efi for a 64-bit x86 system, on boot, the firmware of your machine will find this and it will load this file automatically. You don't have to do anything else. You just put it in this spot and it'll load it and boot it up. So an example application that I made for that. All right, I have an example set up here as a C project. I'll go over that. Um, if you didn't add things to your environment, you can Search ENV and add things to your environment variables in case you need to know how to do this. I don't think I showed this earlier, <laughs> but I got the W64 dev kit folder that I got earlier. That's in my path. So I added that and edited the path and did okay and did all that. So that is available. That's why I have this here. So I can do that. So we'll go to EFIC. These are these C files here. I have NeoVim installed as my editor. You can use whatever you want. So an efi.c file here. So everything that's gonna be in, when I later write EFI applications for a bootloader, you know, this efi.c and the efi.h header, everything that's in here I took straight from the UEFI or other specifications. I don't have any third-party dependencies. I'm not using GNU EFI, I'm not using POSIX EFI. I wrote these headers myself and I wrote all this stuff myself using just the specs and available things. So it's nice that you can program for this you know, from scratch, we'll say, on your own, in C or another language. 
Uh, you can do this in assembly or another language, by the way. I just did C to follow the spec more, but everything that's in there is is in here. So our, our application entry point, we're in a pre-OS environment. We'll be doing a freestanding C development, and I'm not going to name it just main because there might be issues with that. So I named it EFI main, um, and we'll return a status and everything, but I'm not going to go really into this, but this is all available in the spec at certain points. I will go over this later, but this is just an overview of what an application might look like. In this case, a hello world one. Um, this is just to prevent some compiler warnings for unused variables. But EFI sends you a system table pointer by default to your entry point of your EFI application. And from there, you can go and look up console input or output for text processing, taking an input from the user. You'll have boot and runtime services for things like resetting the system down here or for, well, this is for console output. <laughs> You'll have things in boot services for getting memory maps and setting the graphics mode and everything later through GOP, that kind of thing. This is just console input and output and a reset. That's all I'm doing for Hello World. But it provides things through the system table, through a console output struct with function pointers, one of those functions being here set attribute. This will set text color attributes. And this EFI text adder, this is a macro defined in the, the UEFI spec, which will just set a yellow foreground and green background color. That's all I'm doing there. I'm clearing the screen to that background color, which will also set the cursor to the top left of the screen. And I'm just writing text here. So the main reason I'm using C11 or above, I'll be using C17 because C23 is not fully out yet. Um, is for UTF or Unicode support here. So the little, the lowercase u string literals are UTF-16 compliant. They should be. They are on most or all implementations of C. So this will write UTF-16 text, hello world. Since I'm using MinGW and doing this, um, I don't need wide character support. Just I'll support UTF-16 only and I won't deal with WCHAR or anything. Uh, so we can clear the screen, write some text, set some colors, red foreground, black background, be foreboding, saying, hey, you can shut down the machine. And we'll get a key. This is a struct, technically. We'll go through console input, again, provided through the system table to your entry point. There's a read keystroke function. So I'm just checking repeatedly until we press a key and it returns all right. We get a success. We got a key, any key. Then we'll shut down the machine by going through the runtime services table to the reset system function. And we'll give it a value of reset shutdown to shut the machine down. There's also a reboot but we'll just shut it down. Should it return, it'll return success and no extra data. And we should never get here, but if we do, we'll return success. And that's all. So the EFI.h defines these things. These are all basically type defs from the EFI spec. So EFI.h, it looks like this. I'm not gonna go over all this. It's just the basic, you know, hello world example. Uchar.h provides UTF for Unicode support. So I need that for the char 16t type. If that's not available on your machine, you can type def uint least 16t as char 16t, but I'm just going to use uchar.h for, for that. Okay, but these things are available. UEFI defines its own data types, so I just define those. I define some parameter markers here by looking at the EDK2 and uh, GNU EFI source a little bit. EFI API uses the Microsoft API for calling functions. You don't technically need this since making PE files with the GCC cross compiler, MinGW here on Windows, or the Clang setting a target for Windows will do this automatically. It should. So you don't really need this, but it can't hurt just to specify it. We have some stuff here. We have console input and output, some type defs, and all these things again are taken straight from the EFI spec, except for the void pointers. I just left these in if I didn't implement something and I wanted the same spacing within the struct. Um, but that's good. Some annoying parts where the a function could declare a struct, like the text protocols, and the, the struct declares the functions, so they kind of declare themselves, which was annoying. But to get around some circular dependencies there, you can just type def the struct as itself, and then fill it out later, and it'll it'll compile fine. So for text input and output, I did that. These are setting colors. This is that macro to set the color, and I have uh, basically. Basically, everything is just do is just through structs and function pointers and type defs for those things. So we type def some functions, we lay them out in a struct for a protocol, and we can call those things later from our EFI application, from our entry point with the system table. Here's reset data for runtime services. 
And we have an EFI table header, which is at the start of some of these things like the system table or runtime services. We have the table header. We have some other things here. I'm only using reset systems. So that's the only thing I defined. And our system table, so this thing that we're given within our EFI.c file up here, right, the entry point, contains pointers to everything else. So it'll have pointers to the console input and output, standard error if you want that, the runtime and boot services, and some configuration tables. And the config tables and the number here, you can parse those and walk through them, and that'll have things like ACPI, like a system management BIOS, that sort of thing. So that's how you access and enumerate the hardware and devices on your machine. But the nice thing about this is that really everything you ever need is provided by firmware, if they follow the spec, <laughs> through this system table pointer. You can access everything from there. And it's really, it's just programming for a sort of black box library where the implementation of that library is left up to the firmware manufacturer or developer. So we have an open interface to talk to the firmware, but however the firmware is implemented, we don't care. <laughs> so it's it's kind of nice that it's just sort of programming for a library with function calls. And it's, it's yeah, it's pretty easy to program for. I like it a lot. It's standardized. It's not limited to 16-bit. It's not the legacy BIOS. It's it's pretty nice. So how do you build this thing? I do have a, a make file. I don't, I didn't make any changes. I don't really care. Just do that. <laughs> for GCC or Clang, I'm using the cross compiler. I'm just saying I'm going to use the cross compiler here for our file, and I'm specifying C17 standard, so I have access to UTF-16 types and other UTF types and the, the little u string literals and such, setting all extra pedantic for errors. I don't know necessarily if you need no red zone on, no red zone on this stuff, but I figure I'll just leave it there anyway, so I, I have all the stack for myself. I don't have any extra things going on there. Uh, EFI applications will be in a freestanding, a pre-OS pre environment, so we won't have access to libc or anything. So I'm saying, hey, it's going to be freestanding and no standard live, no startup files and things will be included sh or should not be included in the binary. Now we need to make portable executable files. We'll have to set a certain subsystem within those for it to count as an EFI application. That number is 10, and this again is laid out in the UEFI spec. I'm just, as an overview, I'm going over this kind of fast, but... Everything that I'm using, I got from the EFI spec. So I'll show it within that later, or I'll have it pop up on screen or something. Um, the entry point, we're not using regular main. I called it EFI main. And the output, again, I'm calling this special name bootx64 EFI, so it's found on boot and automatically booted from. Clang is similar, except we don't need a cross compiler. We can just set a target. In this case, target triple is x86-64 unknown windows. And then all of these flags are the same as for GCC. We are using a different linker for Clang though. I'm using LLD-link. And for this PE target, we'll say, we do need some different linker syntax. So dash subsystem pass to the linker colon EFI application. And that just puts a 10 at the same spot like up here for the subsystem and setting the entry point and doing that. So if you do that by default, make can make the file or we can do or for this file, we can do make clang, and that'll make it. For mine, by default, clang makes a smaller file at about 2K compared to GCC, but they work the same, so I'm not really going to worry about it. <laughs> they both make 64-bit files by default and everything. You could optimize for size or do other stuff, but I just thought that was interesting. But either way, it works. Um, if you get clone or you take my UEFI GPT image creator, we can use that to build a GPT image, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to copy this file we just made and put it in there. And I can do write GPT on windows.exe. It will find this file if it's in the folder, and it'll add it to the EFI boot directory in the EFI system partition. So then let me check the, <laughs> check the file names I have here. So I'll probably do this differently later, but for running it in QEMU, I'm setting the drive for that file. I'm setting the BIOS from that OVMF BIOS we got earlier, just some basic memory, 256 meg. Display I'm gonna get rid of, so it uses the GTK one so I can zoom in. Uh, VGA standard in case we want standard VGA card, although that should be the default, but that's okay. You can name it. Machine Q35 is good for modern QEMU testing 64-bit. This ensures, among other things, we're using Intel's um, ICH9, Interrupt Controller Hub, or whatever, 9. 
And that has like more modern PCIe and other support and things that are being emulated. Um, .NET none, so I don't mess with PXE boot. And that's QEMU there. So if I run that, we're going to use the test image file, which was built with the boot x64 file we did. So we should be able to emulate that and it boots up. Again, we are setting the text to yellow and the background to green. So maybe I can have fun and chroma key some stuff here. I don't know. Maybe I won't do that in editing. <laughs> but then we're setting some different red text on black background. And if I press a key, I'll press F. It shuts down. So it does everything we told it to do in the EFI.C file, right? And I didn't have to implement these functions. The firmware, in this case, the emulated firmware from TianoCore OVMF, supports these and it just works. We say, I want to make the text these colors, it works. We write the strings, it works. We take a key and shut down and it just works. It's very nice. Um, some other things later on, such as getting memory allocations, memory maps, and setting stuff might not work and we'll have to check errors and things. But for a basic Hello World example, this is fine. So if you want to write that to a USB, which I did earlier conveniently, you can do that through DD or Rufus or something. And we can go ahead and try to boot it on a laptop. Just the test, right? Um, yeah, I don't have a professional setup, so I'm going to record this on my phone. But ideally, we should have the same result as we had within our QEMU emulated stuff there, right? Green background and the text, and press a key and it'll reset or shut down, in this case, the system. All right, so I'm just going to be recording on my phone here, booting from the laptop, see if we have an, uh, the same thing that we saw in QEMU. I need a USB A to C converter that Dell provided because they only have USB C ports on this laptop. So, you know, I'll put that in there and plug it in. If I was using my other USB, it has USB C, but anyway, we'll just plug that in on the right there and I'll turn this on. Hit the power button. This one needs F12 through the boot menu, so I'll just keep tap tapping that. Loading the one time boot menu. So we have stuff over here on the left if it focuses. So the SanDisk Cruiser is that USB, so I'm going to load that. And yeah, we have the same result we got within. QEMU emulation, we have the yellow text on the green background, we have the red text on the black background, press any key to shut down. And I'm gonna press F again, although it doesn't matter, we can do like U. And I press it and the machine shuts off. Hey, reset shutdown. So ideally, we have that <laughs> happen all along the way in the future. And we can have the same result on our laptop or on hardware, ideally, that we have in QEMU. So emulation and hardware. And that is the goal with this, making sure it works on bare metal the whole time. So I don't want to lie to you and be like, hey, this only works in emulation. No, I'm going to write an actual bootloader that works on actual hardware. So hopefully you enjoyed. That's all I got for this video, really. I think I did all, all of these things. Um, the next upcoming videos. I'll be showing, maybe not typing out the whole way, but I'll be showing within the UEFI spec how to write a GPT disk image, which will be in chapter five. If I just make this, that's, that's a little too big, isn't it? <laughs> Let's go down to chapter five, the GUID partition table disk layout. We'll be going through this. It's pretty short, but we'll be writing an MBR and GPT headers and tables. We'll be using CRC32 and GID, GUIDs for things. And after that, to write the actual disk partitions as part of this disk image tool that I'll be rewriting. We'll write an EFI system partition with a FAT32 file system. We'll write a basic data partition. And we'll go on from there. So if you're interested in that, you can watch the next few videos. But it's just going to be rewriting the tool that I wrote before, pretty much. Just hopefully with better code layout than I did and explaining it better. After those videos, I'll be writing the EFI OS loader application, which is going to be for a bootloader. And we'll start off with probably this Hello World example again, just for strings and things, typing it up from the UEFI spec itself. And we'll go on to setting a graphics mode through the GOP, getting memory allocation and memory map set up, or at least know what's out there on our system. Maybe parsing the ACPI or SM BIOS tables through the config tables, through the system table <laughs> and the EFI uh, entry point from that system table pointer, just to see what devices are on our system and you know, we'll, we'll go from there. We'll write the OS loader. Ideally, this would replace, the OS loader will replace my 32-bit bootloader setup in assembly and C. 
or a 64-bit version of my OS or other stuff. But I just want to show you how to make, you know, some simple UEFI programming things to start off with. Hope you enjoyed. Hope this makes sense. If you want to see the disk writing stuff, those will, that'll be upcoming on the next videos. So I'll see you then, or I might not. Either way, that's fine. I appreciate you all. Thanks for watching. I'll see you then. And uh, cheers.